two things. One is how to develop a STEM or technology-based concept that is capable of rapid adaptation. Okay. Actually, uh, uh, David, I have a question for you. Do you mind if I record this so I can let uh, my other team members review this? I'm s oh, of course. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So we're here with David Finkel of, of the Youth Technology course. So keep going, David. So the concept is based on two fundamental principles, which is uh, second and third generation technology is inexpensive or free, uh, uh -huh. but still usable, and they become tools for both learning and impacting the community. So yeah. there's a crucial second step to this, which is community building. And that is the students that participate learn by preparing various technology, obviously mostly uh, desktop computers and laptops. Yeah. Uh, but as they prepare it, they then donate it to first their own community uh -huh. and then um, in, other in other countries. And we've donated, the students have donated computers as far away as um, uh, in, in, in the Eastern Bloc, uh, Bulgaria, yeah. uh, that a number of years ago we sent 100 computers to. So the two concepts. Now, as the technology has changed, uh, we started first with Raspberry Pis, mm -hmm. uh, and then as soon as I became aware of Arduinos, yeah. I assume you're aware of, yeah, of Arduinos? Sure. Um, those... I now view those as a crucial stepping stone. Yeah. So as I understand what you have done to build the technology that you are build, that, that you are creating for community development requires a level of sophistication that is somewhat rare. Yeah. Uh, our concept is to take the first stage of where you want to get uh, to take students who have no interest in technology and in 20 years of experience in this field, it still remains that the vast majority of kids love to play with all the gadgets yeah. but have no interest at all in understanding how they work yeah. or how they can be used or how to pre prepare them. And since we stopped teaching civics, in our schools 20 or 30 years ago, we have nothing in our schools today that gives our students or gives students any sense of community <laughs> and community participation. So I got a question that, for you. Um, sure. Were, was civics actually taught in schools like some time ago? Oh, I'm 72 years old. And when I was in high school in the city of Chicago, uh, there were two parts. One, you had a course that was a semester long that was called civics. And number two, uh, between at the end of your junior year, huh. you had to pass a citizen's test, which basically gave the, 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 kind of, the kind of basics of government and citizen responsibility. Uh, that is long gone from the demands of um, education and a society that is data-driven rather than uh, learning and response-driven. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, if you saw my bio, you saw that I have a, a mixed background between education, politics, and business. Yeah. So my first endeavor in, in government was to understand how not just to, to give kids some technology training, but also to give them... Uh, how to help a community. Uh, and the second part uh, is communities are connected. All communities are connected in some form with other communities, whether it's an immigration issue or people who have traveled vacation to another location or somebody who has cousins who live somewhere. Every community, especially communities who are struggling, will have people that they are connected to uh, in other parts of the world. And so basically, part of this development concept is to build a base and upon that base, use that base to connect to other communities that are already connected. So, so uh, uh, the story starts I, in... May I ask, uh, so community sure. connections, 
uh, which communities are already connected? Like, what are good examples? All right, well, I'm, that's what I'm about to give you. Okay. So started, starting in 2000, um, and this was always by design, I took, uh, I had started the program in Cicero, Illinois, at a school called Morton East. Uh, I started the first program there, mm -hmm. uh, and by 2000, those students had set up seven computer labs in boys and girls clubs and children's centers, uh, and then were teaching middle school and younger kids on their computers. They started first with a typing uh, software, expanded to art and uh, writing letters, uh, and they were at our height teaching 200 middle school kids a year on uh, in seven different locations. Yeah. Now, by 2000, by 99, I sent a letter home to all of the kids. Uh, the school is 95% Hispanic and the vast majority from Mexico. So I sent a letter home to, to their family say, inviting anybody who is interested to have a computer lab delivered to their hometown in Mexico. Three students responded, and in 2000, my wife and I and two staff took six kids to two towns in Durango, Mexico, yeah. and one town in Jalisco. We brought 10 computers, yeah. uh, were successful in Durango, and never got the computers out of customs in Jalisco. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we stayed in Jesus Carrera's grandfather's barn in the Pueblito called Presidios in the municipality of Tepuanas, uh in, in Durango, Mexico. Yeah. That started what is now a 19-year relationship, expanding step by step. So from those first connection, as of today... Number one, this spring, we the, the school in Cicero and the community college together now will host 40 to 50 students and teachers from Durango for the 17th straight year. Uh, the Arduinos, my, uh, our instructors have developed a very effective step-by-step uh, -step lesson plan and lab labs to teach Arduino basics. Um, yeah. Our students, we we are teaching Arduinos in three stages. Yeah. Stage one, stage one is our Arduino labs, and through that, they're using, they're learning how to use the diodes and the resistors and the servo motors, etc., and also how to program them. Uh, from there, when they've completed the labs, they graduate to a, a to kits. And we're using, uh, there are insect kits and robotic car kits uh, that range in price from 30 to $50. Once they have built a kit, and a kit comes with all the parts necessary and all the instructions as far as which program snippets to use to connect to make, to make the car go or the insect to stop at a wall and stop at a, stop at a hole. Those are the first two stages, and they're just learning. When a student gets to level three, they now have enough experience and knowledge to start designing their own projects. Yeah. First using what they know, and then as they go to more sophisticated levels, they go beyond what they know, looking for new components to add and what kind of programming they need to do it. And as you're probably aware, Arduinos are essentially C++. And yeah. so learning, learning to manipulate with Arduinos is really providing, especially at level three, where you're creating, problem solving, and building your yeah. own projects, you're basically building the skills necessary to enter the workforce yeah. in, in a very profound way. Now, the second part, so these kits are very inexpensive. They're, the starter kit is $30. The robotic kits, as I explained, are are. are 30 to maybe 60 or $70. And the extended kit, the robust kit with enough parts to design your own projects are between 80 and $120. Hmm. Now, um, as I said, we have a partnership now that is 17 years long with Durango. That includes two colleges in Durango, the high school in Cicero, 
and the community college in Cicero. Starting two weeks ago, the students in that Morton group uh, who have passed all three levels of Arduinos are now holding weekly webinars starting at 3.30 uh, to 4.10 with the teachers and students in one of the colleges in Durango, and they are teaching the Arduino. We, we ship them uh, enough kits to get started. Add to that, our Evanston, Illinois group is right now preparing 10 laptops for an orphanage and school in El Salvador. Uh, that group is sponsored by a church here in Chicago. Uh, they have agreed to purchase the Arduino kits for that donation. Uh, the computers will be finished before Christmas. We hope to have them delivered by no later than February, and then their students and the Durango students will be participating together in the webinars. Also, um, the students, as I mentioned, the students in, in Cicero are mostly Mexican-American, and so they are providing these webinars in Spanish and English. Uh, we've now translated our labs into Spanish so that the uh, extra groups. What this means is we're setting the stage to be able to project the teaching of Arduino robotics and coding anywhere in the English and Spanish speaking world and a full package of kits can be delivered for under a thousand dollars. Yeah. Now, organizationally, uh, YTC is also a very small organization. Uh, we have no full-time uh, employees at the present, uh, either part-time or volunteers. Um, however, um, well, there's been, a, there's been a number of different evolutions in the organization. Yeah. The need for STEM training of any kind, especially in the after-school environment, is huge. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I, I guess I don't have to go into the details of, of, of how serious a problem it is. Um, so in the early 2000s, as I started to roll the program out, the desire for more programs coming from the city of Chicago and the suburbs um, ramped. At one point, we were operating 12 clubs in the Chicago area. The problem with that was two things. One is... Um, 12 YTC I didn't clubs, you're saying? Yes. So we, we were in seven schools with the program that is in Chicago, the, the most robust after school program in the country. It's called After School Matters. And uh, they pay instructors, they pay stipends to the kids, and they pay for a robust infrastructure that provides training for people who are teaching in after school environments and therefore are not teachers and usually have, they may have expertise in a field, but they usually don't have any uh, understanding or uh, experience in teaching people. Yeah. So that was great for a while, except that managing an after school environment that, that's meeting for two or three hours a day, a couple of days a week and finding people who are qualified to teach uh, and then be responsible if, when they don't show up was simply not feasible without a dramatically greater budget. Uh, and that wasn't my interest. My interest is, is essentially building a movement, uh, something that is, that is more self-sustainable rather than fitting the same model of expensive after-school programs that help a few kids in a few schools but financially can't compete with the larger numbers that simply don't have any resources. So comes back to uh, also in the process of among the funders that we had uh, in a major way was J.P. Morgan Chase. And one of the things they did for us that makes our expansion possible is we have uh, a very robust uh, academic website that allows, number one, all of our data, all of our tests, all of our labs, all of the things that... Uh, one needs to operate uh, are all on the website. It also is an academic website so that each group 
like a, like a teacher teaching a course gets their own site. Each student is logged on. Attendance is taken online. Tests are taken online and automatically graded and dated in terms of each time a student takes the test. Um, and what this does in a dramatic way is it sets the stage for rapid data collection once we expand. So after, after um, I reached 12 programs, it reached a point where I realized that it wasn't working. I was having trouble keeping, uh, getting competent instructors. I was having problems when instructors wouldn't show up and I'd have an angry school saying, why isn't your instructor here? Um, and so we boiled back down to programs where there is a community champion like me. So the Cicero program is my program. I've been working with that school for 20 years. That program costs very little because I have people from all over the school, three teachers, uh, two of the secretaries. Uh, the principal of the school is from the town uh, in Tepewanis that I first came to. He's now a very close friend. And so um, in each case where we build programs, what we're looking for is a or group of champions who basically say, I need to have that program in my community or in my school because our kids aren't getting any of this. Mm -hmm. And once they say that, a program can start for as little as nothing with a volunteer who doesn't really, you know, when you're looking at secondhand technology, especially in desktop and laptop computers, the processes aren't really all that complicated except for serious problems. So someone who is a tinkerer and naturally curious mm -hmm. can lead a group of kids. I am not a tech. I still am not a tech. When I started the first program, I had one of my corporate clients contact me saying, hey, I've got 100 computers coming offline and we're going to just throw them out unless you think you can use them. I told the principal at the time of, uh, of the school where I had started the first computer club, and I said, find a place for me to have the kids work on 100 computers or I'll take the computers elsewhere. And he found the basement. And so the point being, this is a, a technology concept that basically gets any community and any school that is desiring to really start in, in, in honest practicality the response is far more positive internationally than it is nationally. Um, but in either case, uh, this becomes the opportunity. The second part is that the Rango Connection has now grown by, again, this was by plan, to involve and integrate two communities. And so the Durango communities uh, in the one area of Durango, there's about six different municipalities now that are all part of that group. And the entire Cicero community, um, in both cases, we're talking about the government and education, as well as the, the members of the local community. And so the interaction and the connections lay a groundwork. Now, from there, the Evanston group Every year that we have the, the large group from Durango come, we uh, they're hosted in their in the homes of students and teachers in the Cicero School. Mm -hmm. But we take smaller groups, seven or eight at a time, to the different other clubs in Chicago. So the Evanston group by 2015, we're saying, hey, we're Evanston. Why aren't we working with another group outside of uh, outside? Mm -hmm. So they first chose. New Orleans because of the problems it had with Katrina. And in 2016, I took six kids and five laptops that the, they had refurbished to New Orleans. Uh, we were connected with both a church and a small charter school. Uh, they, the church had a bunch of computers that had been given to them. In one day, the team from Evanston refurbished and, and set up 40 computers. They took five of them along with the laptops and spent a day at the uh, charter school teaching the teachers what to do with the computers and holding a four-hour class with all the, the charter school had about 60 kids. They held a four-hour class with, the, with all 60 kids, taking apart and putting back together uh, the 10 computers that they had brought along with them. So, 
you can see the concept is expansion of human connection rather than just pure technology. Yeah. Now, what I see from what I already read of you and now what you're also telling me is that there's a couple of natural connections here. Um, our concept is community building, and that is your concept. Yours, you're dealing with the, the hardware and the community building aspects of farming and building infrastructure. I'm concerned with building the skills and the more basic digital technology so that they're connected to the world and they know how to use it. And so I see some natural applications. Now, financially, um, YTC right now with four programs, uh, uh, a free one-week overnight computer camp, uh, an international competition when the, the group from Durango comes to Chicago, operates on a budget of about $65,000. And we're stable in the sense that I can raise between the various sources we have uh, around sixty to 70000 and between the volunteer hours uh, and the support from the different schools that host our programs, we're able to operate at that level. However, we can't grow at that level. In other words, if, if we're going to be able to offer on a larger scale, uh, we need to scale up. So I right now have uh, two proposals out um, one proposal is to a, a mid-range uh, investment banker uh, that is run by uh, uh, a very good friend of mine and has been on the board. Um, he, they're going to, it looks pretty certain that they're going to give us 50000 uh, And then one of my uh, top board members is a top executive in the drug company Estellas. Um, and we have a, another large proposal of equal amount with them. And then we have five other grant opportunities. And so what we're, we're now set, setting the stage for is to, to raise about 150000 in the first level to take uh, one of our employees to uh, a full-time position uh, to uh, manage the clubs, and he's got four years of experience, and he's the one who wrote the Arduino Labs. And then uh, another amount to hire Cindy uh, to focus on development. I, we need a development director, and we've already talked at some, Cindy and I have talked at some length about how this would be set up in terms of the first level of raising money and then the second level of raising money. So yeah. that's uh, kind of in a nutshell what uh, YTC is. Uh, oh, one last thing. Uh, our competition uh, is called Titanium Tech, mm -hmm. and uh, we have that uh, trademarked. So ty uh, Titanium Tech competition is really available as we build the other pieces of this. Um, for uh, marketing as well as uh, fun. What do you think are ways we can collaborate? Well, number one is any community, since our operation is such that the Arduino coding labs and development can be set up, A, for very little money, uh, and in an English or Spanish speaking environment uh, can be picked up. Now, as I said, I am not a tech, and yet uh, you know, the labs and the kits are simple and straightforward enough where anybody that's serious about learning it can do so. So that's that's one option. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I I want to learn a little bit more about your various projects, the, the various tools that you've developed, and uh, how. Like it sounds like now, uh, for you to uh, for somebody to learn how to build one of your one of your kits, uh, really requires you to go and uh, provide a 
uh, seminar in, in terms of teaching them how to do it. What we do is, is that- we, we do we do one day builds like for example the three D printer. We offer workshops where you can build that in a single day. Now the thing that we we focus on is distributive enterprise, meaning we teach also how to build the things for enterprise purposes. So. Our design is completely open, so if somebody wants to learn to build 3D printers, that's something we can take to the community and say, okay, hey guys, start up a, a small enterprise producing business, uh, pr- producing 3D printers or other other things. Now, I say 3D printer because that's the thing that we have fully rolled out as a regular workshop. We can do other things like build a brick press or the tractor or a house in five days. Those are in development, but for right now, it's the basic technology with a 3D printer and soon to roll out the filament maker, which means you're taking scrap plastic and returning that into 3D printing filament. Um, So the revenue model for us is running workshops where people pay to take the machines home with them, um, or just participate in an immersion build experience. That's how we operate. Now, um, the entrepreneurial part might be a way to pitch to different communities, but for us it's... uh, a lot of it is still around the development effort as well. Like we're actually developing real technology and getting people involved in that. And to do that, we generate pr- the language of, of like physical design is part libraries like CAD, CAD files. So we generate those and we generate them like a construction set approach so that when we have the part library for the 3D printer, you could build various uh, instances of that, such as a small printer, one that's six feet tall, one that's like a cubic cubic meter, so you can do different things. So that's that's the kind of approach we take. So um, let me ask a question about that. Yeah. If if you're if somebody was interested in the entrepreneurial aspect of building the, your 3D printers yeah. that you designed, number one, a what is the cost of the material of, of materials, and how complicated is it? Right. Not only purchase. But to get the materials delivered to, you know, relatively remote locations. Well, it's common off the shelf parts from Amazon and MasterCard and eBay. And we focus on that, that you can like, unlike other people where they might have a lot of custom parts, we focus on easy to source so you can repair it, build it yourself. Cost currently is $500 for the whole kit. Now to do a, what we'd like to do for enterprises have have people operate through the framework where we give three-day immersion training for, uh, for people to get involved not only in uh, the build as a basic basic training but also in a capacity to use CAD and to further develop. So we are interested in training people to become part of the development effort. Now it depends how serious somebody is. If somebody's really serious after they build the printer they can study all of our materials including our 400 page build manual and all the details it's all online and they could go to town with it. But the thing is, nobody is an entrepreneur these days, so nobody has replicated our enterprise aspect yet. But I think that will happen quite a bit more as the product just gets rolled out and, and the quality improves so that it's a, it's a real high-quality contender to anything that's out there. So, but how will, how will, so $500, you're talking about $500, in other words, to assemble all the parts to build the If you were to buy... The parts off the shelf, you'd be paying five hundred dollars for them. Okay, so that's in other words, if somebody wants to do this, their their cost before they they calculate their labor is five hundred dollars a piece. Yeah. How robust how robust is is the printer then, and how large is the platform that it it can build? Yeah, the printer is an eight by eight print bed, but like that's for the the five hundred dollar price level. But the, the interesting thing is that if you build a much larger one, because our design is scalable, you're just ex- extending the parts, you get a much higher value there because it would cost, say, like $1,000 in materials for a printer that is one cubic meter where you can print much larger things. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Um... And then again, going back, do you know how robust it is? I'm, I'm quite familiar with 3D printers, at least the low end. Uh, and yeah. there are there are yeah. there are 3D printers that you can buy for as little as $170. Well, uh, how robust they don't... is it? Maybe I can show you its specifications. Um, 
So let me just paste that link. Do you know how to access the link in, in Jitsi here? Probably not. <laughs> so click on the bottom, the bottom left. There's a thing that's like the text bubble. And I just pasted microfactory.opensourceecology.org slash kits. And that describes what we're offering there, the features in our printer. Uh, which, so there's two open, one looks like a, a share your screen. Yeah, hit the one to the right of that, which is open, close chat. After the hand. Now, you know, the, the thing we're currently working on is just doing another video where we show, okay, here's all the things that you can build with this. Here's some cool products. That's so far missing. Like, we haven't spent a lot of time on that yet. But we're, we're working on a video where we can make a compelling case. Hey, you can actually start a business making PVC fittings or cordless, cordless drills. But that requires design. That's where the design effort would be excellent, getting clubs involved to do regular builds and every three months, regular design work, and every three months we would call less into an event like First Robotics for for public product design and where we actually build something in a contest setting. So, in terms of community, like schools and uh, governments, uh, that's that's not going to uh, fly. What I do have, though, so in the years that I've been working in Durango, um, Mexico, many of the communities in, throughout Mexico, uh, when they come to the United States and other countries, um, as they become successful, they form clubs to help their hometown back in, in Mexico or in, yeah. in another country. And uh, this is very true in, in Durango. And uh, there is a federation of, cl of clubs in the uh, Midwest, uh, including uh, Chicago, but it includes five states. Uh, there are 16 clubs that are members, uh, and that includes my organization. And through that, I've, uh, these are people who are successful here and sending money and resources back. They send, they send money. They send uh, a lot of medical stuff, including uh, uh, ambulances and uh, higher tech medical equipment that's uh, second generation. Um, and through that, a couple of the people who are uh, members of the of the federation are manufacturers here in the states. Yeah. Um, and. I'm thinking of two of them in particular that might find this interesting in terms of being able to start. The question is, comparatively, uh, I don't know how competitive your product would be in what's available here in the United States in places like Micro Center um, or uh, CDW uh, that specialize in, in the industry. Uh, who, who are these, like CDW, who's that? Computer Discount Warehouse. Okay. Or uh, Micro Center. Have you ever? Heard, are you familiar with Micro Center? No, not really. So Micro Center is uh, a tech industry. I, I, they're a cross between a retailer and a wholesaler. They only have. Uh, I think they may have eight stores nationally. Yeah. They're locked and their supply and. Um, they are competitive, at least competitive with everybody else out there, and most of the time they're uh, yeah. much lower than, than the cost. Yeah, I mean, we, we're not in, the, in that category. We're in a category of, of builds for people who want to get into production or, or people who want to understand the technology. So our, our market is more education and production, because production for those people who get serious about producing things, and, and we're a little young on that in the sense, as I mentioned, we, we don't have like some parts manufacturing that's part of the development that we need to do, like, like for example, a cordless drill or, a, or an aerial drone, things like that. We want to develop a set of blueprints for common useful objects. Like we want to print 
rubber tracks for the tractor using our larger printer because you can print in rubber things like that so we're interested in industrial applications uh, but the way we're trying to go about it is is go through the professional development cha channel for teachers and librarians who can then start a club build a 3d printer use it at their school use it for education but also get involved in a larger product development mission so that's that's the ideal approach for us like right now for example in london ontario i'm doing a three-day immersion training for the people there that are running the the club and they're taking that as part of their uh, continuing education is that so how often will that club meet uh weekly so they're gonna when you say weekly once a week once a week yes for like two hours or so it's an after school program session um, and what do you hope uh, a club of kid of teenagers meeting for two hours once a week? What do you what do you are looking for them to accomplish? Uh, to do design work. So so generate part libraries that all of us break a complex machine down into parts. We b use the existing part libraries, and in one instance, you can just take the part libraries, and you can build from those, and you can make enhancements to that. So that's the kind of skill that we're aiming to teach to people from the high school level up. So you're looking not for them necessarily to build the product, but, but to be in the design, be part of the design process for more products? It's, yes, it's an open product development process, which culminates every three months in a real build and a product release of something that we put into what we call our open source everything store. So we're developing products, tangible products that can be marketable. But what would what will the is this something that the kids in this particular club are going to do, or are they going to be part of your team of developers who will contribute to that process? We all work in parallel globally by breaking down a project into parts mm -hmm. according sure. to a collaboration architecture, and we all pull together. Like for example, we we discussed the cordless drill as the first project we would take on. So we would break teams down. Maybe the London, Ontario team takes the battery pack. Another team in Missouri takes on the drill chuck or whatever. You know, so we divide and conquer, and there's a, there's a whole modular design build architecture that we have developed that allows large teams to work together. So ideally, we would have like a think of, of this when you know, we got 50 clubs, 100 clubs in a few years. We've got a thousand people sitting down contributing two hours a week, two thousand hours a week. And then as such, the continuity there leads to significant projects being designed. So that's that's the vision to get a large number of people now to manage the kind of process. It will take some energy. So we're building an infrastructure for that. Um, the students who uh, are doing this. What what skill sets are, are do if they're doing the design work? What skill level are they do, do they need to come into the program to be able to contribute? They need a skill level of learning the basics of FreeCAD, the open source three D CAD software. That's the basics. That's that plus regular online collaborative tools like wikis and Google Docs. And uh, is. Uh, does a group that wants to start a club like uh, this London, Ontario, are they paying you for the club or are you, can they do this? Are, the fact that they're participating and helping you develop, is that uh, uh, sufficient? They, or are you... The relationship works in that we train the people, we train the advisor of the club. The advisor, in fact, two people who are serving as advisors for that club we train them in a three-day program. We charge them $2,000 for the three days, including building the 3D printer to prototype more parts. So the commitment is that we are training you. You're putting in time to actually be a club mentor, and we get paid for starting that. And from then on, it's uh, we have uh, basically a club charter, and we develop and, and then end up collaborating on making the real live event happen. So we both uh, plan out the, the quarterly design, what that should be, and then get resources to offer prizes for that. Because along with the 
physical event, we will be hosting a Hero X crowd incentive design challenge. So as we state, okay, we, we're going to develop this cordless drill. We're also going to put that online through a crowd incentive platform like Hero X. I don't know if you've heard of Hero X. It's an offshoot of the X Prize, but we put that both online and for the club. So we have two kind of two parallel efforts. It's people within the clubs and then the general public that can participate in this incentive design challenge that's got a monetary reward for it uh, based on maximum collaboration. Okay. Um, I need to digest. Um, I'm not sure how we can be of assistance to each other immediately. Yeah. Um, there may be there may be some organizations or there may be an again I am political, so I, I have con I have strong connections throughout the state of Durango from the governor on down. I'm working yeah. with my former governor now. Um, I'm, I have some good contacts into this organization called After School Matters, and yeah. both the Chicago Public Schools and the Chicago Teachers Union. Yeah. Uh, so, do you have in a in concise form? what your proposal for a club is to a community uh, or to a school? Please take a look at this thing. And let me see. Let me put it in a chat box. This is the best we have so far. It's That's all we have, and I'm going to keep working on that to create more dedicated material. Uh, no, sorry, wrong. Uh, wrong link. Um, the link... That's the same as link as last time. So now, yeah, it goes under professional development. So if you wouldn't mind clicking on that, pl please there. Um, it shows the basic idea, but we're pitching this as, as a chance for teachers to do design that matters. Um, so yeah, yeah, and, and open source product development. Okay. Um, yeah, I see. I'll, I'll take a closer look at that. Yeah. Um, I mean, what you mean, and, and I see, I mean, uh, as I develop these different relationships, um, the kind of practical side, I, I guess... My my perspective on print, so you're really focused on really the design process. That's what you're trying to build out, rather uh, uh, the products themselves. How? Well, uh, in other sorry, words, I, I so, didn't hear that. Say, say it again, please. Your your focus then seems to be more on the design process than the product generation. And the product generation is from a entrepreneurial model, um, which involves cost, time, and sales. Um, so I'm not well, sure. Well, I mean, we're trying to aim at both, and maybe we're not focused enough. But the idea is that, yes, we get involved in product design, but there's an explicit goal of a product release every quarter. And then yeah, we would build up... You say uh, Marcin, when you say a product release, yeah, what you're saying, if I understand what, what you mean, you're saying that, in effect, when it's done, you will build a prototype to show that it works. The, well, not only a prototype. Well, the, the, it's iterative prototyping, so by the time it comes down to, I mean, every week we'd be doing 3D printing and prototyping, building out as much as we can, especially if we have a lot of people, but that intent is to, is to create real product releases, and on top of that, your economic analysis, a website, production engineering, all the assets that would go into actual delivery of that product. But you have not done that for any of the products yet? You uh, have... Well, we're close. I mean, we've got a lot of the assets developed for the, the 3D printer workshop. I mean, all of those plans are there, and we have the basic economic model published and so forth. So, um, you know, like if you take the 3D printer, you can right now download our plans, 
check out the production engineering and go to town building it yourself you know well but what, what, what is the so what does the economic model look like if it costs if it costs me a thousand dollars to build a, a robust piece of equipment uh, and it's going to take how many hours to build uh, six hours from the kit oh wow okay uh, so that's that, that's nominal um, what is in, in other words, what is the equation? What what the is the market is, market value so, of that thousand dollar product? Yeah, uh, I mean, so if you build those kits right now, part of our work is doing kit sales or immersion workshops. For example, twelve people we sign we host a workshop, twelve people sign up, we charge them three hundred dollars above the bill of materials. So if the printer is five hundred, we charge eight hundred. If twelve people show up, we're making thirty six hundred in a day. For a workshop that's marketed and, and or people simply buy kits so using the kit model now the other part is which is also compelling and that's why we, we engage this public development process that is actually producing parts like start up a little business online producing any kind of crazy PVC fitting or ABS fitting kind of deal or making no, no, wireless I, drills I so you're looking but you don't have any entrepreneurial model in terms of how that works either from the building of the kit to to to, to sell the three sell multiples of the 3d printer versus well, you have a 3d printer and now you can do different things with it that you can sell based on what your local market is and that's that's dependent only on the 3D printer. It's not dependent on the fact that you built you happen to build the 3D printer yourself. Though I would say after the experience with three different types of 3D printers, building it yourself probably automatically includes the ability to repair and replace as necessary because you've built it yourself and you know how it's put together. Exactly. Now, you're asking about the revenue model, but I mean, the revenue model for us has been workshops. That's how we do it. And we'd like to encourage others to do that because there could be plenty of opportunity to do either simple build workshops or engage people who are already doing STEM education and add that to their product line. They can teach STEM or professional development around the builds of 3D printers where then you can teach people CAD and design skills. So the, the, the real problem with that is simply selling it to schools or school systems. Right. Right. That is. That's, that's called marketing and establishing relationships. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So where are, where are you at with that? Well, we're having initial conversations with a lot of different people like yourself and other teachers and librarians. And uh, since we just posted this workshop, that's our first workshop for the three-day immersion. So after the results of that, we can get testimonials and promote that kind of approach through the, the professional development route is one way we're exploring. But the other part is simple uh, Facebook ads and other advertising that gets us kit sales that we can then fulfill. So kit model and the immersion build model. So you're able to so you're able to assemble the, the, the everything that go that's needed and put it into a kit. As you said, you are able to add, to resource it off of eBay and, and other um, yeah. digital resources. So you put the kit together and then and and and, and sell it for five hundred dollars. That's correct. Oh, we don't sell it for five hundred. We sell it for eight hundred. The seven ninety nine. So that's okay. It. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a markup. For selling kits, so sure, of course. Yeah, I mean that's that's how you're you're you're, you're paying paying the cost. Yeah. All right, it's very interesting, and I and I mean I'm not sure um, what and how in your present level and in YTC's present level. Um, I am just going through a major uh, uh, fundraising yeah. to to build uh, to build a stronger organization to accommodate. Uh, you know, for my what YTC does, which is dramatically different than from what you do, is we basically have a, 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 a 
a concept and a product concept that runs a range of cost, no matter what somebody's budget is. Right. Yours has um, um, an upfront cost that's not ridiculous, um, but for a lot of schools, um, school systems and in, in, in struggling communities, um, that could come at a cost, I'm not sure. Um, well, the idea there would be to have sponsors um, for low-income communities, have sponsors do that. So we'd like to say that, okay, if you want to start a design effort in your community to build real products, then talk to us and we'll help you find money because it's more important to find the interesting people. I think the money is easier to find if you have... Uh, I don't think the money is an issue, I think. The finding interested people who are really passionate about open product development and entrepreneurship, STEM, and open source technology, that's the real challenge. Uh, I think it's both. Yeah. Um, having, having been doing this for more than 20 years. Right. Um, it, it depends. I mean... I, I have some uh, a number of friends who are, and actually protégés, who have uh, moved rather uh, high up the ladder in STEM education. Yeah. Um, one of whom I'll get together with over Christmas. Um, he runs a uh, international STEM consultancy. That's one of the tops in the in the world. I'm curious. I'll I'll, I'll bring this up with him when yeah. I see him. I mean, the, the market research that we're trying to do is essentially to talk to people in a STEM field and say, okay, well, what are your needs? Is there anything we can fill? Is there a way to, collect, uh, to connect professional education, STEM, and this? Well, the package that we're offering, uh, you know, uh, professional education, STEM education, and design that matters. You know, if people are interested in that, that's what we do. All right. Well... I really appreciate the time, and I'm sorry yeah. I uh, interrupted your uh, your other conference call. No, no problem. Uh, give me some time to think about it. I'm uh, uh, slow in processing, yeah. uh, and I'll come back to you both probably with both a couple of questions and a couple of ideas about yeah. uh, you know, how I might be able to help you or make some introductions for you right. or, or how we might be able to work together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one one ask is, I mean, do you are you familiar with the world of professional development? Uh, well, let's put it this way. Another protege of mine, Joe Hildebrand, is um, uh, one of the directors of Mozilla and in charge of Firefox. Okay. So, uh, and through Joe, uh, who I just saw in October, um, although he's like all of, like everybody in that field is very busy because they work 24-7. Mm -hmm. Um We've, we're, we're discussing my next stage of development, which will also be uh, accessing and uh, involving the open source community. Uh huh. Yeah. So, again, as I say, I, I don't, uh, I, I process slowly. Okay. Let, me, let, let me think about this, and I'll be back to you in a few days. The next time we talk, I want to have, uh, as I mentioned, my plan involves uh, either. Taking Cindy on as a consultant, well, initially taking her on a consultant uh, as a consultant, but my hope is that we, we with her help, we I, I build a financial engine to uh, be able to take her on full time. Yeah. Um, the I'm not sure. Has you have has your funding included any grants? Have you done any uh, applications for STEM funding? No, we really haven't. We're we're trying to do it in a bootstrap route, so we're you know we're we're scalable that way. So trying to develop the workshop model, but no, we haven't done much of that. And it sounds like you'd rather not. You, you want to do it on a, on a, what you, what would yeah. be a sustainable methodology? Yeah, we'd like to see it in a scalable fashion, sustainable and scalable revenue model i don't think the fund the foundations are are scalable or reliable in that sense they're certainly not reliable right so yeah but david what's what's your email so i can send you a quick follow-up yes. it's it's my name david dot finkel and that's f as in frank i-n-k-e-l at 
YT Corps, Y T C O R P S dot O R G. Yeah. And uh, let me give you my uh, cell phone. And when you send me something, include your cell phone as well so uh, we can text and stay in touch. Okay. My cell phone is 773 425 9569. 9569, okay. Okay. Marcin, where are you based? Kansas City, Missouri. And are you did am, am I correct that Cindy said you were doing a workshop here in Chicago? Oh we were but we didn't do the we didn't really do any marketing for it so nobody signed up so we didn't we didn't really pursue it. But we're trying okay. to uh, we have a, an interest form on our website where people register and there's like six or so people interested in the workshop in Chicago. So we will I will follow up with them in the next few days. And see if uh, they're interested, so we can actually bring a physical workshop to Chicago. Yeah. Now I hold a summer camp, usually at the end of July, at a state park uh, in Missouri, uh, about an hour north of, uh, about an hour northwest of uh, St. Louis. Yeah. And um, I'll keep you posted when 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 we're going to do that. Uh, that's a hop, skip, and a jump from Kansas City. Perhaps yeah. we can connect. Yeah. Yeah. That would be interesting. All right. Well, this has been very informative. Uh, I have a lot of uh, food for thought to, to think about in terms of where YTC is and what we're doing and what our connections are uh, and what you're trying to do. Um, as I said, I will be back to you. Uh, I'll talk to uh, Cindy in the meantime. And uh, the next time we talk, it'll be a three-way so that we can have yeah. the benefit of her thoughts as well. Yeah. Yeah, David. Well, thank you so much for your time. And, yeah, I look forward to continuing the discussion, see if we can brew something up. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your time, too, Marcin. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care.